Hey everyone, it's Ina007 here, and it's another episode of Vassals of Kingsgraves, Agatha Christie, Linear Reread. Today we're on episode 45, and we are talking about A Pocket Full of Rye, originally published in November 1953. So Agatha Christie is 63 at this point. This is a Miss Marple novel, and we are recording it as a mini pod. It's not typically regarded as top tier Christie, although I actually think it's rather interesting. And it's famous, I suppose, for being a nursery rhyme novel. I think probably one of the better ones insofar as the nursery rhyme involved is very interwoven into the story. It doesn't feel forced in as it did with One, Two, Buckle My Shoe or Five Little Pigs. And the overall plot concept is that a London businessman, Rex Fortescue, is dies after drinking his morning cup of tea. And when he's found dead, it's discovered that he has a pocket full of rye, so some cereal grains in his pocket. As with many Agatha Christie stories, we then discover that he has a family of dependent children who are after his fortune when he dies. And in comes Detective Inspector Neil to try and discover what was going on. And Miss Marple gets involved because a maid that she trained is currently the parlour maid in the house. As always, this will be a spoiler-free discussion until the end credits music, at which point we'll get into the solution to the novel and the clues. So there was rather a short publication gap between After the Funeral, that was published in March 1953, and this novel published in November 53. So let's get into a little bit the historical events that would have been the context for contemporary readers. In May 1953, Aldous Huxley first tried the psychedelic hallucinogen mescaline, inspiring his iconic book, The Doors of Perception. And actually, this idea that people are experimenting with new drugs is part of the the novel. Also in that month, Sir Edmund Hillary from New Zealand and Tenzing Norgay from Nepal became the first men to summit Mount Everest. In June 1953, Elizabeth II was crowned Queen of the United Kingdom and the other Commonwealth realms at Westminster Abbey. And also in June 1953, CIA Technical Services staff head Sidney Gottlieb approved the use of LSD in an MK Ultra subproject. So again, this idea of Cold War and using drugs to manipulate the mind, very much in the air when this novel was being written. Also in that month, Egypt declared itself a republic. In July 1953, the Korean War ends with a Korean armistice agreement. It's interesting, actually, no formal peace treaty has ever been signed. So technically speaking, the United States is still at war with Korea. August 1953, we see the overthrow of the democratically elected Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, by Iranian military in favour of strengthening the monarchical rule of the Shah of Iran, with the support of the United States CIA and that of the United Kingdom. How did that work out for us? Probably not good to intervene in other people's um, democratically elected governments, I guess. September 1953, sugar rationing finally ends in the UK. And it's amazing to me, you know, World War II started in 1939. It ends in 1945 and only eight years later does sugar rationing end. Also will come up in this book. November 1953, Laos and Cambodia become independent from France and the French Indo-Chinese War begins in Vietnam. So this really is a period of great technological process especially when it comes to knowledge of pharmaceuticals and hallucinogenics. It is the rise of the Cold War with hot war flashes as we decolonize and increasing intervention in overseas governments. Against that backdrop, we continue to see incredible social change depicted by Agatha Christie. And as you all know, the part of the motivation for me to do this reread was to see how this author operating from 1920 to 1970 observed the change in how people lived in this period. And you can really see that in this novel. The novel has a sort of quite sour, quite dark tone to it. It's quite unpleasant. A lot of the characters are unpleasant. But I think it's also an unpleasant novel because so many people are frustrated by and disapproving of social change. So, for example, at the start of the novel, when Rex Fortescue is poisoned, but he's not yet dead, there's a lot of kerfuffle in his city office about how to summon medical help. 
because this is also the period at which the UK, thanks to Anira and Bevan, has created the National Health Service. It's very new. People don't really know how it operates. And there's a lot of actually quite comedic confusion. This is how it plays out in the novel. Where was there a doctor near here? Nobody knew. Miss Bell seized a telephone directory and began looking up doctors under D. But it was not a classified directory and doctors were not automatically listed like taxi ranks. Someone suggested a hospital, but which hospital? It has to be the right hospital, Miss Summers insisted, or else they won't come. Because of the national health, I mean. It's got to be in the area. Someone suggested 999, but Miss Griffith was shocked at that and said it would mean the police and that would never do. For citizens of a country which enjoyed the benefits of medical service for all, a group of quite reasonably intelligent women showed incredible ignorance of correct procedure. Miss Bell started looking up ambulances under A. Miss Griffith said, there's his own doctor. He must have a doctor. Someone rushed for the private address book. Miss Griffith instructed the office boy to go out and find a doctor somehow, anywhere. In the, private adre- in the private address book, Miss Griffith found Sir Edwin Sanderman with an address in Harley Street. Miss Grosvenor collapsed in a chair, wailed in a voice whose accent was notice- noticeably less Mayfair than usual. I made the tea just as usual. Really, I did. There couldn't have been anything wrong in it. So there we go. And it's kind of funny, actually. Last night, I went to see a new play at the National Theatre called Nye about Anoira and Bevan and the fight to create the National Health Service. It stars Michael Sheen, who you may know from um, the Neil Gaiman TV show. And it's really tremendous. So if you're interested in finding out more about this very interesting, dramatic, disruptive, but ultimately fantastic change in British society, then check that play out. But yes, complete mayhem as to how this National Health Service operates and where to find a doctor. We also see the rise of the wireless and radio and the British Broadcasting Corporation. We have religious nutter Aunt Effie mentioning wireless licences and pleading, I don't want to pay my wireless licence. And we also have mention of the third programme, which I guess becomes BBC Radio 3. Um, And also, as I said, with the events of the time, the idea of the Cold War, of science fiction, of new and exciting things being invented. When Miss Marple is looking at her parlour-maid Gladys's room, she sees all the newspaper cuttings that Gladys has made. And she says there were cuttings about flying saucers, about secret weapons, about truth drugs used by Russians and claims for fantastic drugs discovered by American doctors. All the witchcraft, so Neil thought, of our 20th century, which is a wonderful phrase. And it's interesting, isn't it, that here we mention truth drugs used by Russians, and yet earlier in the events of the time, we hear about MK Ultra using drugs. So this was very much not something that um, Paul Gladys was making up. This was very much happening at the time. Gerald Wright, who is a socialist um, school teacher, he wants to establish a school, also comments on the, the age. Quote, what an age we live in. On one side, the manufacture of atom bombs. On the other, our newspapers delight in reporting brutal murders. End quote. So yes, we are in the period post Oppenheimer for all of you who have seen that film. And yes, the war is still a factor, as I said, you know, it's only as this book was being published that sugar rationing ended. We get the idea that Rex Fortescue made some of his money in the black market. Um, It's commented at various points. Miss Grosvenor was an incredibly glamorous blonde. She wore an expensively cut little black suit and her shapely legs were encased in the very best and most expensive black market nylons. Later on, we'll realise that Gladys has a pair of expensive black market nylons too. And sadly, we also are still in the era where people are mourning um, their husbands, fathers, sons who died in the war. Lady Anstis is a war widow and Mrs Mackenzie lost a child at Dunkirk, just as Agatha Christie lost her son-in-law in in the Battle of Normandy. So this is still very much a post-war Britain dealing with grieving, dealing with the black market ongoing and rationing, but also facing some of the wonders of the atomic age and some of the new techniques that our secret services will be employing in the Cold War. So let's get into the characters of the story. Our investigating team is really led by Inspector Neil, who is, I think, a really fantastic character. Um, He's very smart. 
He has a very deadpan wit. He will make the odd comment to his social superiors, the people he's investigating in, which shows he absolutely has seen right through them. I think he's a really compelling and attractive character. And he is joined about 100 pages into this 250-page novel by Miss Marple, who is, as we know, very self-effacing, always refers to herself as an old woman with feminine ways of intuition, but is absolutely razor sharp, and puts on this persona right of a cuddly, trustworthy old woman to lure people into telling her what they really think or telling them their secrets. But Miss Marple is also a product of her time, right? She is someone who is going to notice that you can't get the quite right help these days. She's training these young parlour maids who come effectively from an orphanage. And, you know, she'll notice that they don't quite do the dusting properly. They don't notice the cobwebs. Standards are slipping, but she's too nice to mention it. And I really love Miss Marple in this novel. And I think Miss Marple and Inspector Neil make a really compelling detecting duo because as we discover that the murder is following the kind of the plot of the nursery rhyme, so there is Miss Marple who is saying, look, these are following the nursery rhyme, take me seriously, and Inspector Neil's being a bit more rational and a bit more logical. But it, there is a mutual respect, and it's a lovely little dance that they have, which is, I think, the most compelling part of the book. The family under investigation, well, there's the murder victim, Rex Fortescue. He is apparently wealthy, apparently made his fortune in a rather unscrupulous way. Um, He's of Romanian origin, which is interesting. He made his money, we're led to believe, in black markets. He has various investment holdings. We're led to understand that he basically has got some investments that are very risk-less or sort of less risky and some that are really like punts, so really risky. And he's been increasing those of late and acting very erratically, much to the chagrin of his son Percival, who thinks that he's frittering away the family fortune and really wants his father Rex to go and see a doctor, maybe has dementia, you know, why is he acting so strangely? So Percival, in contrast to Rex, is very sensible, very severe. We don't really see much of him actually in this book, but he is the principal person who's going to inherit the business now that Rex is dead. So Rex married the mother of his two sons and a daughter. She died quite young. And so he's very recently made a new marriage to a much younger woman. Her name is Adele Fortescue. She's 30 years younger than him, so the same age as the sons. And it's implied by a lot of people that she's common, that she's working class, that she's not the same class as Rex. Class plays a massive part in this novel. You have Rex Fortescue, who I guess is new money. And he lives in a sort of stockbroker belt, new built, rather vulgar house. And I think it's very much Agatha Christie's authorial voice who's looking down on this. And I guess it's probably exactly the kind of house her first husband lived in, in a stockbroker belt town with lots of golf courses. And the malevolence and the contempt that Agatha Christie shows in her description is really strong. And in particular, there's a hilarious passage where through Inspector Neil, Agatha Christie is saying it's it's so so pretentious to call this house Yew Tree Lodge because it's not a lodge at all. It's a mansion. And Inspector Neil describes growing up in some poverty in an actual lodge. So a gate lodge of a big house and how they didn't really have electricity and they didn't have sort of proper lighting. But actually, it was a very good, hearty and worthwhile way to live. So I think Agatha Christie is very much siding with Inspector Neil. And I guess the reader in thinking that, that those were the good old days. <laughs> and um, this new money is all rather gauche. So the wife is seen as working class Adele. And this is a trope we've seen in a lot of Agatha Christie, right? The late in life guy who makes a potentially unwise second marriage, gets bumped off and then someone is accused of having an affair with the wife. So in this case, she's accused of having an affair with Vivian Edward Dubois, who is a golf and tennis coach. (laughs) And yes, so this is something that we've seen in Cricket House. It's something that we've seen in many novels, certainly the post-war years. um, It's a trope that Agatha Christie uses again and again. Turning back to Rex Fortescue's children, so Percival works with him in the family business and he is married to Jennifer Fortescue, who they met when um, Percival was ill with pneumonia. She nursed him back to her health, but she she just comes across as really bored by her life. She eats a lot of chocolates. She sits around doing not very, very much at all and is rather a pitiable creature. And again, it's implied that maybe she's not quite of the same class as Rex, even though Rex himself is new money. The second son is called Lancelot, so they both have these really fanciful names. 
and he's the black sheep of the family. Basically, it's implied, a bit like Agatha Christie's brother Monty, that he'd been a bit feckless as a young man and maybe forged a bad check. And he's been banished from the family business and has run off to Kenya, one of Britain's colonial um, territories, where a lot of bad eggs seem to go to make a second chance of their life. And there he has married Patricia Fortescue, who is quasi-aristocratic, which is very impressive to Rex because Rex admires the aristocracy. He, he's very pleased his prodigal son has married up in the world. And Patricia has a really sort of interesting life. She considers herself to be very very unlucky. She lost her first husband in World War II. She lost her second husband, who was Lord Frederick Anstis, to suicide. She's very much in love with Lance, but she tells Miss Marple that she thinks she's bad luck because her husband's come to a bad end. And also, Lancelot Fortescue himself describes himself as a bit of a cad. And he's quite fun, but he's quite, um, you know, he openly talks about sort of, oh, let me kind of make my big brother's life miserable by pretending I want to join the business. So from his own mouth, he's saying as he's a bit mischievous. So that's Lancelot and Pat. And then finally, there is Rex Fortescue's daughter, Elaine, who is a young child, who was the youngest child. She's in her 20s. There's an element of having a bit of the same type of arrested development as the girl in The Moving Finger. Um, and she also mirrors the wife in They Do It With Mirrors, who lets her idealistic husband build a school for unfortunate kids so basically she'd wanted to marry Gerald Wright this idealistic school teacher um, but when the dad disapproves of the marriage and says look if you marry this guy I'm going to cut you off without a penny Gerald Wright says right the marriage is off and poor Elaine rather than thinking oh he just wants me for my money so he can build a school now that her father's dead is cock a hoop because now she gets the inheritance and she can marry Gerald and it's all just absolutely tragic throwing herself away on this guy who clearly wants her for his money and then I guess the final member of the upstairs family is Rex Fortescue's sister-in-law um, she was the elder sister of Rex's first wife and this is exactly the same setup as Crooked House in this case Aunt Effie is I think, a really hilarious character. So after Inspector Neil and Miss Marple, I think this is the other compelling character in the book. She has really stern religious views on things. She's really moralizing and pedantic and just unpleasant, but in a really funny way. And she is fond of missionaries. And Mrs. Miss Marple plays on her pedantry really well and sort of invades herself into the family to stay at Utree Lodge, thanks to this old, um, really appalling woman, Aunt Effie. The other people in the house are the staff, and we have Mary Dove, the housekeeper. She's competent, she's calm, and she's basically a forerunner of the character in 450 from Paradington, but a bit less Mary Poppinsy. This idea that it's so hard to get staff now that people will pay above the odds for anyone remotely competent in household management. And she's interesting because she's a really cool customer. She's really cynical. She describes all the characters in depth to the inspector, has no problem bitching about them and calling out their affairs and their character traits. So she's quite interesting as a character and reminds me a little bit of um, the character in Death on the Nile, um, who is the best friend with the murder victim, but doesn't actually go to the Nile, but is very cynical and moves from rich house to rich house. If you've read on the Death of Nile, you'll know who I mean. And then we have Mr. Crump, the dipsomaniac butler. <laughs> Um, who is hopeless and he comes with his wife Mrs Crump he's a very competent cook and we have poor Gladys Martin the parlour maid who fee previously worked for Miss Marple and we're meant to understand that she's a bit thick she's not very clever she's not very pretty Miss Marple kind of took pity on her and it's testament to Miss Marple's not cynicism but rather clear-eyed nature that she understands that the world doesn't really have much to offer someone like Gladys Martin, that her lack of smarts and looks are going to hold her back. And that she is, because of that, uniquely vulnerable to anyone who's a little bit charming and takes an interest in her. And it's, it's actually a very sad and tragic character, Gladys. Finally, we have Mrs. McKenzie, who is the widow of Mr. McKenzie, who was previously a business partner of Rex Fortescue and was done over by him over a potential gold mine in East Africa. And she's currently in a sanitarium, which prompts a scene, which I think is actually pretty well written, actually, quite tricksy about what she remembers, what she doesn't remember, what tense she's in at the time she's making the utterances. It gives us some clues. And she had two children, Donald and Ruby, 
Donald died at Dunkirk very tragically, and Ruby is um, someone that Mrs. Mackenzie has disowned. So, as with many Agatha Christie books, you also have the potential that someone isn't their correct identity, and that maybe the grown-up Ruby Mackenzie is one of the characters in the novel. Okay, so that's the setup. As I said, you know, you have this, the murder in the city, but really most of the action takes place in the house at Utree Lodge because very quickly the pathologist realizes that. The murder victim was poisoned with taxine, which does not act immediately like cyanide. So it would not have been put in his office cup of um, tea by his secretary. Actually, he probably had it earlier in the day over breakfast. It's very bitter, so it was probably introduced to him in his morning coffee, and it would have been slow acting and killed him a few hours later. So that's why we're focusing so much on the people in the household and their motivations for potentially killing Rex. In terms of whether the novel is progressive or regressive, actually, I couldn't find anything particularly offensive in it. Maybe some of the sexy secretary descriptions. But I think in a sense, this is just Agatha Christie as always being very straightforward about sex and very sex positive in a way and seeing that as a very vital part of people's lives and a key motivation. Now let's move on to adaptations. So there are two. The first is the Miss Marple series, broadcast by the BBC, starring Joan Hickson in 1985. And it stars Tom Wilkinson as Inspector Neal, the late lamented Tom Wilkinson. And also Timothy West is in this one as Rex Fortescue, and his wife Prunella Scales will be in the next one. So that's quite fun. As always with this series, I found it quite faithful, but quite plodding to a modern viewer. It feels quite slow, and it's probably one I would not revisit. The second version was adapted by ITV and was broadcast in 2009 as part of the Agatha Christie's Marple series. And this one stars Julia McKenzie, and I quite like her actually as, as Miss Marple. What's quite surprising is that this series, it, in the other episodes, is quite camp and takes great delight at completely distorting the plot and changing it up. But this version is actually incredibly faithful. In fact, it's probably more faithful than the Joan Hickson, quoting and lifting lines of dialogue from the book, um, which is really wonderful. It stars Matthew McFadden, uh, known to Succession fans as Tom Wamsgams, as Inspector Neil. And I think he really captures Neil's intelligence and his deadpan wit. And yeah, I think he's a really good piece of casting there. And it also stars Rupert Graves as Lancelot. It's, it's a very well cast um, adaptation. I think it's really worth watching. It moves along at a great pace and it's actually quite moving. Um, in its treatment of some of the characters. So yes, two adaptations, and I would focus, rare, uh, this is very unusual, I would say focus on the ITV more recent one for this. Okay, so that's all for today that's spoiler free. As I would say, I quite like this novel because I think the plotting is tight. I like the characters, particularly Neil and Marple. And I feel that although some of the tropes and plot and character are, well, not plot, but the character, and I feel that even though some of the character set up and the relationships in the family are recycled from earlier Agatha Christie's, that this is actually a pretty good read. I read it all in one sitting and I rather enjoyed it. And I particularly enjoyed its rather sour, nasty tone. I mean, this house is not a pleasant place to be in. From that perspective, it is a little bit like succession. I mean, people have no problem describing how they don't like people in the family. Um, but it is it feels very credible somehow. So that's all for the spoiler free section. Join us next time for Destination Unknown, published in 1954. It is one of the mystery or thriller novels. And join us after the music for the spoilers and the clues. <laughs> Okay, so the solution to this is that Lancelot Fortescue killed his father in order to engineer the fact that Percival should break up the business, keep all the safe investments and give him all the dodgy ones because he has been in Africa and he realises that the Blackbird gold mine, far from being a dud, is probably full of very rich um, uranium deposits that can be used in the atomic age and make him very rich. He uses the nursery rhyme to create a distraction for the investigators. He befriends poor Gladys when she's working at a holiday camp, realises she's desperate for love, persuades her to go and apply for a job at Yew Tree Lodge. And of course, households of that kind are always looking for staff, so there's always going to be an opening. 
he gives her some taxine poison and gets her to put it in the marmalade that is bitter, so it would disguise the taste, that only his father would eat. She thinks it's some kind of truth drug, this being the age of MK Ultra and hallucinogenics, that is going to persuade him, Rex, that is, to admit to his wrongdoing against Lancelot. She doesn't realise she's killing him. And so when Rex Fortescue is murdered, she's absolutely in a tizzy. And that explains all her behaviour on the day of the murder, that she is distracted. She is wearing her best nylons and shoes because she has a crash meeting with her boyfriend, Bert, a.k.a. Lancelot. And that's why the tea is only half brought in. You know, she brings in one tea tray, but leaves the other on the sideboard because she re- she meets him in the garden. She sees he's arrived where he then strangles her, which is very sad. And she becomes the second murder. He then murders basically the wife, the second wife, effectively to complete the nursery rhyme, but also to make sure that she doesn't inherit either. Um, And so there we have it. Those are the three murders all committed by Lancelot. What are the clues? Well, we know from the character description from Miss Marple that Gladys is desperate for love and very credulous and needs excitement. We know from the newspaper clippings, they contain news of um, atomic material found in mines in Tanganyika. And we also hear of the, the Russians using the truth drug. So this is a story Gladys might have believed. We know she was wearing her best nylon, so she was probably going to meet a boyfriend. And we see postcards from the boyfriend, although no picture. And we also see a little bit of dissimulation over the location of the Blackbird mines. Lance keeps saying Blackbird is in West Africa, but Miss Effie, who has a very good memory, says it's in East Africa. We also should understand that if Lance could come over for a secret visit three months prior with his father, why not more often? So why would he not be in the country more often to affect a more deep-seated plan? So I think Agatha Christie does very much play fair here. There are some red herrings of tall, of, after all. I think knowing that Donald Mackenzie died in Dunkirk and that Pat Fortescue's first husband was also called Don and was a fighter pilot might make you think that she was perhaps married to him. Um, there's the whole kind of plot line around Jennifer Fortescue being the daughter of Mrs. Mackenzie. And it's she who basically killed the blackbirds and put them in the desk as a sort of silly prank. And then we have Mary Dove, who we find out is basically someone who stays in various country houses as sort of head housekeeper. And then three months after she's gone, there's a convenient robbery. So it all does tie up rather well. I think this is tightly plotted. I really like Inspector Neil. I like Miss Marple. I like Miss Aunt Effie. The other characters are all rather sour. And the criticism I would make, and maybe why this isn't seen as top tier, Christy, is because they are all rather unlikable. But actually, I think that's the strength of the book. I think the tone of this book, the feel of the book is very convincing. Maybe why people don't like it as much as it's not as as kind of overly clued and scripted as something like they do it with mirrors. But then again, I think that's to its benefit because I think the plot mechanics of this are very credible. Anyway, if you agree or disagree with my take, feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube channel. You can find us on our Discord server and join the conversation there. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.